In this episode, we'll be implementing both batch rendering and sprite sheets. Batch rendering is the ability to render a large number of things, in our case quads, with a single draw call. This is not necessary for the kind of game we're making, but since it's not much extra code, and it's a pretty useful concept to learn, I've decided to include it. A sprite sheet, or sprite atlas, allows us to pack together a bunch of textures into one large texture, and then we can choose which sub-texture we want to render. We'll also do a little bit of refactoring, moving around a bunch of variables out of globals, as they don't really need to be there. All right, first up, we're just going to delete this render field in the global struct. We'll use a combination of static variables and function returns instead, as these globals aren't actually required. In render.h, we don't need the render state type any longer. We can also return a pointer to an SDL window from the render init function. And finally, the render end function needs access to the window, so we'll just pass it in as a parameter. Moving over to render internal.h, we don't need the render state internal type anymore either. Since we won't be using this type, we have to adjust the parameters of the init shaders function to take a pointer to the default shader, as well as two floats that I'll explain shortly render width and render height. Copy the fields from the render state internal type and then delete it. Paste the fields at the top of render.c and make them static variables. This will ensure that they're only visible inside this file. Now since we deleted the global render state, we need to add the window width and height back in as static variables. We'll be using pixel art for this game with a base resolution of 640 by 360. That's one third of 1080p. And as such, we can set this scale variable to 3. If you've been following along and using a different resolution, that's fine. Just find a comfortable multiple that works for now. And later on, we'll handle other resolutions. Moving down to the init function, we want to return the SDL window from this function and pass in window width and window height. We need to adjust the call to init shaders as well. Everywhere we're using state variables, it needs to be adjusted to use the static variables that we just created. For the end function, we want to pass in the window pointer. In render init.c, we were actually already passing in the width and height, so just update the create window function to use those arguments. Updating the init shaders function, we can move the projection matrix into here as it's not used again anywhere else. We also need to update the arguments and use them. The way we're scaling up our pixel art is by using an orthographic projection that's the pixel size we want, and then applying this projection to the whole window. Everything we have rendering at the moment will now look three times larger. Finally, over in main, we want to get a window pointer back from render init, and then pass that into render end. To calculate the sizes of these bodies, we'll use an SDL function for now called uh, get window size. Finally, in types.h, there has been a missing include for yonks, but uh, since we've been compiling with msvc, and that does kind of funky stuff, we never got an error. The size t type is actually defined in stdef.h, so just include that now. Since we changed the scale of everything, we should adjust our test sizes and other values. The sizes we chose didn't divide well by three, so we'll just go with some arbitrary sizes that I found to work fine for now. Halve the gravity to negative 100, and change the terminal velocity to negative 7000. In render.h, we want a way to get the scale. We'll use a temporary getter function for now. Now implement that in render.c, and then move straight on to main. Left and right velocities can be set to 600, set the jump velocity to 2000, and remove the velocity change on holding down. Change the enemy's velocity to 400, and we'll have to adjust the size of our bodies as well. We also need to move the spawn points, as our level is now 640 by 360 pixels, and if we keep the player spawning at a height of 800, it'll be off the screen. We'll also resize the player to 24 by 24, adjust the starting positions of other entities and static bodies, and halve their sizes. Now before we run the game, head to entity.c to fix a bug I introduced last episode. The entities do not need to be scaled down, as the scaling is already taken care of in the physics module. Now run the game and check that everything looks kind of okay for now. I made a mistake earlier with the width and height, so just follow what's going on in the code here to remedy that. Next up, we'll move into creating a batch renderer. I know I said in a comment that we wouldn't do this, but it's not much more code, so let's do it anyway. We'll create a new shader for this that will be explained in the future. Create a batch quad.vert shader and fill it out as such. I'll explain what's going on while typing. So with a batch renderer, we basically want to send a big buffer of stuff to draw all at once instead of drawing each thing separately. 
That means where we would use uniform variables like uh, color, we now have to pack that into the big buffer because if we're gonna draw all of the buffers at once, or sorry, the whole buffer at once, which could be, let's say 100 quads, and then we send a uniform, it's gonna apply that uniform to all 100 quads. So our buffer is gonna contain the position of each quad, the UV coordinates or texture coordinates for each quad and the color of each quad. So if we have three quads that we wanna draw, the buffer will contain position, UVs, color, position, UVs, color, position, UVs, color. The projection doesn't change, so we can still pass that in as a uniform variable. We'll pass the UVs and color onto the fragment shader. But now the fragment shader is very simple. It'll be updated in the future. In render.h, we'll describe our batch vertex type to make them easier to deal with. We'll also define a maximum number of quads to draw in one frame. This is because we need to prepare memory on the GPU and we need to know how much memory to prepare. We'll also define max vertices and max elements. Quads have four vertices and they're made from two triangles. So they have six elements, one for each corner of the two triangles. We'll temporarily add a function called append quad that takes the parameters we need for a batch vertex. Over in the internal render header, we'll need to pass a pointer to our new shader to init shaders. As well as that, we'll create a new function to initialize the new batch quad buffers. Jumping into render init, we'll first update the init shaders function. Pretty simply, we just want to use exactly the same code as the default shader. Next up, we'll fill out the render init batch quads function. It's similar to the init quad function, but instead of just supplying a single set of six indices, we'll supply 60,000 in this case. To our VBO, we'll pass in null as the data will be passed into this buffer before each draw call. For that reason, we'll make sure to tell OpenGL these values will be changing by using the GL dynamic draw flag. The vertex attributes are the ones we discussed earlier, position, texture coordinates, and color. We can use the offset of macro to simplify this. Using offset of, we don't have to worry about remembering the size or position of each field in our buffer. It'll give us the correct offset even if we add new fields in between the current ones. Over in render.c, we want to create a new OpenGL handle for our shader. We'll also create uh, VAO, VBO, and EBO, as well as an array list to hold our batch vertices. We'll pass in a pointer to our batch shader and initialize the batch vertex list. Now the way this is going to work is that each frame will set the list to a length of zero. And then during the frame, we'll queue up our vertices by appending to the list. And then in the render end function, we'll call a function to draw them all. Speaking of, after setting the length to zero in render begin, create a new static function called render batch. Now this one doesn't need to take the vertices as, as an argument because we have access to the batch list in this file. Either way you want to make it is fine for now. This function will be changing in the future regardless as we want to handle drawing multiple textures at once. In any case, we want to bind the batch VBO, then use the GL buffer subdata function to send the data to the buffer on the GPU. The data we're sending is the batch vertices that are stored in our list. For now, we'll just use one texture. So set the active texture to zero, then bind the texture ID. Next, we'll use the batch shader program. Bind the batch VAO and draw our triangles. The count we passed in is the amount of vertices. Since there's four vertices per quad, we use a shift right by two, which is the same as a divide by four. That gives us the amount of quads we're drawing. We can then multiply that by six to get the element count. Remember, it's six elements per quad as each quad is two triangles. Now it's time to fill out the append quad function. First, we'll define some UV coordinates that will serve as defaults. Since our VEC4 type is an array and arrays decay to pointers when passed into functions, it's possible to pass null to this function. If the user passes null for the texture coordinates, we'll use defaults. Otherwise, we'll use the ones provided by the user. Then we'll just append the four vertices of the quad to the batch vertex list. Nothing too special here, just bottom left and right, top right and left corners. Finally, in the render end function, we'll call the render batch function we created, passing in list batch items and length, as well as just the color texture for now. Finally, back over in main, we're ready to test out the new batch renderer. Warning that if you have photosensitive epilepsy or something similar, there's about to be a bunch of flashing different colored quads everywhere. So skip forward five seconds from now to avoid that. The last part of this episode, we'll be implementing a way to draw from a sprite sheet. The sprite sheet, for those of you who don't know, is just a texture that contains many subtextures, usually laid out as a grid. 
There are more complex sprite sheets that can work with different sizes in the same image, but for our case, we'll just go with one size for every subtexture or sprite, if you will. Before we jump into the code, I want to talk a bit about code design. There's a particular way to design code that I tend to gravitate to as of late, and I find it quite clean and intuitive. I start at what I'd like the call site code to look like. In our case, we know we have a batch renderer up and running. We want to be able to draw particular frames from a sprite sheet. We can think of frames as being a row and a column. We also know we want to draw at a particular position. We don't care how this stuff is drawn, we just assume the renderer does it efficiently. Given these parameters, we can design a function like this. Okay, so that's how we can draw, but what's this sprite sheet type going to look like? What data do we need to calculate how to draw the frames? Well, as we just said, we need a row and a column. We also need to know how many pixels each row and column is, as well as the total width and height of the entire sprite sheet to calculate the texture coordinates. Lastly, we need to know which texture to draw. So that's an OpenGL texture handle. Okay, now we know what data we'll be passing in. We need a way to load the texture and initialize the sprite sheet. For that, we'll use the same method as above. We want a sprite sheet pointer, the one to initialize. We know a texture generally comes from an image file, so we'll need a path. And since we aren't writing code to automatically figure out sprite sizes, we need to supply the cell width and height. Now, moving on to render.c, first we'll import our util header. We also want to import a library, stbimage.h. We'll use this to load our textures. Make sure to define stbimage implementation here as well. In the init function, we need to also call a function to flip the images on load, as else they'll be upside down. Moving down to the append quad function, we want to make that one static, as we'll just use it internally from now. In the render end function, we'll add a new parameter called batch texture ID and pass that into the batch rendering function. Next, we'll be filling out the two sprite sheet functions we designed earlier. For the init function, we'll just handle loading the data internally. First, we'll generate a texture for the sprite sheet. We'll set up a texture to use nearest neighbor scaling as that is best for pixel art. If you don't know what that is, here's an example on screen of linear versus nearest. Now we'll load the texture using stbi load, exiting if there's no data, and then using an OpenGL function called glTextImage2D to send the texture data to the GPU. Since we're using 24-bit PNGs, we set the data type to RGBA8. We can free the loaded data as it's now on the GPU and not needed on the CPU side any longer. Finally, we set the parameters for the sprite sheet and we're done with that one. Next up is the function we call as the user to render a frame. Since we're using a sprite sheet, we need to calculate the texture coordinates based on the row, column, dimensions, and cell size. We'll create a new static function to handle that called calculate sprite sheet texture coordinates. Takes a vec4 to store the result in, the row, column, texture width, and height, and the cell width and height as arguments. Since texture coordinates are always a range from zero to one, we just divide one by the width, divided by the cell width to get the texture coordinate width. Do the same for height, and then store the four corners in the result variable. Since it's an array, it's passed by reference, and we don't need to return anything. Now that we have the texture coordinates, we can use the same append quad function to add this quad to the batch list. We'll just calculate the bottom left corner, always passing in a white color for now. Back in main, we're ready to use this. We'll first create our sprite sheet for the player, loading in the player sprite that you can get from the repo on GitHub. Initialize the sprite sheet using a cell width and height of 24. Down in the main loop, we can use render sprite sheet frame a few times. We'll draw a couple of random frames first to see that it's working, and then also draw one at the player's position. Finally, make sure to pass in the player sprite sheet texture ID into the render end function. If everything went well, we should be seeing multiple little dudes being drawn on the screen with one at the player's position. Alright, thank you for watching, and in the next episode, we'll go over how to use more than one sprite sheet at a time so we can get the enemies up and running.